Welcome, Adam. I understand that that what you've done, because I've seen your very, very excellent outline, and what you've done is that in order to facilitate the sharing of this so that we have a very powerful visual that we can share together with the viewers, you've created a PowerPoint of the narrative history that you wish to share with us of the real Star Wars, and perhaps we want to get uh, started with that now, uh, unless there's anything that you'd like to say prior to that. Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll start it up in just a minute or two. Um, but to begin with, I just want to welcome everyone who's watching this here today. And the decision to finally release this information um, in this way is one of immense gravity for me. Um, it's been something I have considered doing for many, many years, and I have, uh, until now, uh, kept a lot of these pieces to myself because either I hadn't made all the connections that needed to be made, meaning I hadn't met certain people that allowed me to confirm certain parts of my research, so I didn't have enough confirmation on certain factors, um, or I have had a great deal of concern about releasing the information because this, this series of information is literally the living life stories of over 50 of the closest people to me in my life. Um, they're people who showed up in my life in uh, what I like to call synchronistic ways, but just fantastic coincidences and, you know, in some cases, miraculous events occurred to bring me together with the individuals who I've done this transpersonal psychology research with. And um, as we start, I'll, I'll give a little bit more context for what kind of research that is and, and how it goes. Um, so, you know, first I want to kind of set the stage so that those of you who are listening and are a part of this can really understand where this information comes from. And I also want to be very, very clear up front that uh, none of this information um, in, in the format that I'm going to share it with you today is what I would call channeled information. Um, all of this information is from direct uh, what we call um, spontaneous recall or experiential recall um, in which individuals have had uh, very, very visceral memories come up and be triggered by certain events happening in their lives. Meeting another individual uh, is often the most prominent trigger, and sometimes being in a certain place on Earth uh, or having a certain event happen or be handed a certain kind of tool. Um, my earliest spontaneous recall experiences were uh, when I was first handed uh, a sword when I was a small kid. And the first time I held a real sword, something uh, amazing happened. It was as if a part of my brain opened up and unlocked and a whole piece of consciousness that I didn't know was there before suddenly began to flow and stream from me. And the experience was immediately that I'd held this sword a thousand times. I knew exactly how to use it. And, you know, I knew how it balanced. I knew how it flowed. And my whole mind-body memory uh, was expressed that level of knowledge and expertise with something that I had never held before in my life. And this is a physical example of what a spontaneous recall can be like, but they often also accompany um, direct memories, visions, seeing events, and oftentimes really, really intense emotional experiences because uh, a lot of the major events that we have experienced as a species um, in this lifetime, perhaps in other lifetimes, whether or not you believe in multiple lifetimes, the data is still absolutely valid and relevant if you consider 
that our genetic encoding may be carrying some of this information from previous times or experiences of other beings. But without further ado, I'll go ahead and bring up the slides and we can dive in. And Alfred, I, again, I just want to um, invite you to pause me at any moment, ask questions, sure. and if I'm going to get to the, the answers uh, later on in the presentation, I'll just let you know that we're going to get there sure. and to hang tight and, and roll with it. So let me go ahead and activate this screen sharing. All right. Tell me if you can see that as a nice full screen share yes. there, Alfred. Yes, yes, it has okay. uh, the full screen. Fantastic, screen. fantastic. Uh, so we're going to call this segment Galactic History. Um, I like to subtitle that with the secret history of the galaxy as remembered by participants in an interpersonal psychology study. Um, and to be accurate, it's actually transpersonal. And so I mentioned a little bit about what um, what spontaneous experiential recall is, and I'm just going to revisit that for a second. Um, anytime you have a spontaneous recall, and everybody's had one, it's when you hear a song, you get a smell in your nose, and then all of a sudden, boom, it's as if you have the full visceral feeling and energetic experience in your body, sensorial experience, memories, emotions, physiological changes, that reflect a moment when that, that specific song or smell or person came into your life before. Let's say you had a really, really bad fight with your stepmom when you're young, you haven't seen her for 10 years, and then the first time you see her again, boom, there, there it comes. All the emotions, all these energies, flashes of memory, um, all of these pieces come up. A lot of us get it from smells or from hearing different kinds of songs or music, songs that remind us of times in our life. But there's a certain kind of spontaneous experiential recall that we study in transpersonal psychology that is, is a little different than the one that most people are familiar with. And, and, most, and yet most people still, in my experience, have had at least one or two of these events in their lives, and they just don't really know how to explain it. And this is what we call non-local experiential recall, or non-local spontaneous recall, where you suddenly have a memory or a feeling and an experience triggered by something that you, you don't understand why it's been triggered, but the memory or the experience is of something that you never went through in this life. So, for example, um, one of my early ones was I was in a dorm room with uh, a few friends, and I was speaking with these two gentlemen, um, and we were sipping a cup of coffee, and one of my friends, Rachel, was sitting on her bed talking to these two girls, and I looked over at her. And all of a sudden, spontaneously, out of the blue, I have this flashback that I, I'm in this giant medieval ballroom, and she's got her hair up, and she's laughing and giggling with these two ladies, and I'm speaking with these two lords, and I'm discussing with them how to protect the grain trade between our lands. And I'm looking at her, and I'm, I'm feeling all this love for her, and I'm, I'm knowing that this is the woman that I would marry in that lifetime, or that, that was my love in that time, and then all of a sudden, I'm back in the dorm room, and I realize I have no idea what I was talking to the two guys about previously, because all that's in my head is the name of this valley, and this, the grain trade, and how it can protect this, this caravan from brigands. And they're looking at me and they're like, are you okay? And I wasn't sure if I was okay. I, I was like, I don't know, excuse me. And I got up and I went out to the water fountain in the hall of the dorm and I come back and I open the door to the room and my friend Rachel is in the bathroom. She's washing her face off and she looks at me with these eyes and I look at her and she's like, did you? And I was like, oh my God, you did too? And she's like, yeah. And that was one of the first times I've had a spontaneous recall with somebody else in which we both remembered another time that never happened 
in this life. And now there's something also very interesting about this, and it gets particularly interesting when you start dealing with more than two people. So when we talk about transpersonal psychology, we're talking about a study of experiences, memories, qualities of consciousness that extend beyond conventional ideas of identity and locality. So you have a concept of who you are, right? You, you think you know who you are from how you grew up and your parents taught you some stuff. You've got some genetic stuff. You know, your teachers taught you certain things. You picked up certain patterns around your friends. And yet there is some qualities to our consciousness and our behaviors that don't actually fit in the box of the stream of events that we know about so far in our lives. And because of these, these what we call um, uh, extraneous events or special events, sometimes transcendental events, there's a lot of information about us and who we are that we need a wider realm of study to be able to really grasp and understand. And so it's this process of this greater realm of study and being open to where, where, where do these memories come from? Where do these insights we have come from? Where do these spontaneous recall experiences come from that has led me on this journey to, to uh, a path of actually documenting this historical narrative that goes far, far back beyond the time that we're living in now, and even beyond the historical narrative that we know of on Earth. In fact, that's an entirely different story and a different presentation and interview that perhaps we'll do at an appropriate time, Alfred, which is actually the memories and the history of the story of what's happened on Earth since the time of Atlantis, as recorded and shared by many of these people who have been participating in the study with me for the past 15 years. Excellent. And so we're also going to be applying sociocultural anthropology principles, which is looking at cultures and ethnographies through the lens of these individual experiences. So by the, my own experiences and those of others that, that we're going to reference throughout this talk, um, we're looking also at the social and the cultural context, like why do people behave the way they behave? Why do these certain species behave a certain way in this context? And, um, and so we're going to apply a lot of these very scientific principles to this approach, which is really important because we're dealing with information that most people don't even imagine could be true or real in our everyday lives. Um, so I have a picture here of some samurai because uh, I used these same methods to study one of my lifetimes, which was as a samurai in Japan. And I had had a bunch of very faint elements of those memories um, and, and just a faint kind of sense of who I was and that I was there um, and some emotional memory through some of the people that I had known from there. But it wasn't until I went to Japan and I actually talked with a, uh, a Japanese translator who was interested in my story. She thought I must have lived in Japan most of my life because of how I behaved there. And I said, no, I've, I've never been to Japan before, but I kind of remember being a samurai in past lives. And she said to me, well, that's really interesting. She's like, what was, what was your family? Um, what was your family common? Like the symbol for your family. And I said, well, you know, I see these curved, um, like little curved elements going off in three directions. They look like little hoops, but there's some kind of pattern and I don't know what it is, but that's what I remember seeing on my flags and, you know, hanging from my armor. And she, she looked at me and she says, Oh, Tokugawa. And I was like, Tokugawa? And she says, yeah, that sounds like Tokugawa Kama. And so then she pulls it up on her phone and she shows me. And sure enough, it is exactly the image I'd had in my mind for since I, for like 10 years or something, since I first started having these little hints of this memory as a samurai. And 
I was blown away. I mean, it just lit me up. And then she started doing muscle testing with me and to identify the date of my birth. And we identified the year of my birth. And it turns out there was only one person in the Tokugawa family born during that year. Um, and my memories match the landscapes uh, of the place where he had a prefecture. And I ended up going after this to do Tai Chi in this royal, um, this area of the royal city. And I was doing Tai Chi and this uh, Japanese photographer was shooting pictures of me and comes over and shows me the picture. And I happened to be doing uh, one of these moves and directly above my head, right behind my head, on the side of this armory building, is the Tokugawa sigil again. Um, and so it, there's, there's these powerful ways that we can confirm memories and experiences through data that we do have in this lifetime. And so a big part of this journey together is actually going to be looking at the narrative of some of the science fiction that we are familiar with in this time, and primarily the Star Wars series. Because there's something very interesting about the Star Wars series, and that's that, you know, George Lucas doesn't look, you know, when he, he talks about it and in his original interviews, you know, he's talking about it like it's this mythological story of something that actually happened in a galaxy far, far away. And that this is a real thing that went down and he's captured it and he's turning it into the movies and why does everybody resonate with it why does it hit everyone so powerfully and so deeply well my belief is that it resonates with people because many of us were actually there when the events similar to these events in these movies actually happened and it, it took me about about four or five years in doing my research of this very specific period in the galaxy before I started to realize all of the correlations with the Star Wars movies. I'd already done the research. Um, and then I suddenly looked at there and I, I watched one of the Star Wars movies again. And then I looked at the research and I was like, oh my God, this is this is a very, very, very interesting parallel. So we'll explore some of those parallels a little bit further. And um, again, like I said, this is over 50 different individuals who have shared recall with me. Um, many of them have had recall experiences prior to the ones that they had with me and also after. Um, and I've done my best to put together timelines of these different individuals' experiences. Um, and many of them also involved three or more people. And, uh, you know, in some of these events, a third person who has had nothing to do with two other people um, in this series of experiences will would spontaneously know and remember names, um, events, and things that two other people had only privately recalled and shared with each other. Um, and and it, it gets quite specific. So for the purpose of our presentation, I'm going to Stay a little bit wider in the view and give you an overview of the of the actual journey of the events. Um, because if I get into too much detail, uh, we might be here for the next 10 hours or something. So, um, <laughs> so I will go ahead and and dive in. Alfred, did you have anything you wanted to say about the intro or any questions? I uh, no, I I find this to be utterly fascinating. So I'm I'm just kind of letting it unfold and awaiting more to know great okay well let's dive right in then so we're going to start right in the heart of the topic that's probably uh going to be intense for some people to uh to hear about and i just want to contextualize this uh this period of the presentation a little bit um and by saying that this is a very traumatic period within our galaxy. And so if, if you have strong emotions or feelings come up during this part of the presentation, it's fine. Just take the time, pause the video if you need to, um, take a break and, and reflect on it because 
I'm going to share some very real events, and some of you watching this um, may actually have direct memories of some of these events that occurred um, that spontaneously come up during this call. So we're going to take you through it and just bear with us and, and flow with us. So this part one is about um, the beginning of the Orion Wars uh, as, you know, the Orion Wars, so to speak, as a quote, is, is a term that's been used by certain channels to talk about a series of um, interplanetary or intergalactic battles uh, that happened a very, very long time ago in this galaxy. Um, but my research and my data is not based on any of those channelings or any of those books. This is from this pure interpersonal and transpersonal psychology research and the direct memories of the people that I've worked with. Um, and it happens to coincide, believe, you know, what's not unsurprisingly, it happens to coincide with much of the data um, already shared by many other channels and individuals. So where we're going to talk about is in the Orion star region. And in particular, we're going to talk about a planetary system um, that my information says is near Betelgeuse. It's not on in the star Betelgeuse's system itself, but it's a nearby star system to Betelgeuse, which is uh, in the Orion star region, and it's actually the um, the bright orangish red star in the far upper left corner of Orion. And um, the Shihaly system is a solar system in which two planets uh, have the capacity for life. One is very, very Earth-like, and the other planet is a desert planet. And this desert planet has, underneath its surface, um, crystalline caves with massive amounts of water. Um, and I find a lot of interesting correlations in the memories that myself and many of these others have of this desert planet with some of the other science fiction stories in the modern era, including Dune, um, even... Uh, movies like the one with Arnold Schwarzenegger where he goes to Mars and there's water hidden under the surface of Mars. Uh, total Recall, that's it. Um, and, and a few other things. Uh, there, there are some interesting correlations there. Um, but I'll just get to the story and then you can, you can explore and consider some of those correlations for yourself in more depth. So what happened was basically a a group of starships began to assault this pair of planets. It came out of nowhere. And the Shihaly, um, they're naturally a uh, very, very creative species, um, rich, rich cultural narratives around martial arts and performance and dancing with fire. And, um, and as, a, as a culture, many of the elements that we see in the current uh, or actually more like the past um, 200, 300 years of Oriental culture, um, map very closely to the Shihaly's culture. Um, it's very Taoist by nature in its, in its fundamental format. Um, and I would say like the first galactic samurai come from the Shihaly. And the species is, uh, you know, they were kind of naturally trained as warriors and and strength and com competition and um, working in this way with each other. And so when, you know, a fleet of ships showed up and started to raid their planets, um, it came as quite a shock. Uh, but fortunately, they, many of the Shihei were able to act fast enough to retreat to places where they could hold off the assault. And, um, and my experience of this uh, event uh, initially that occurred, uh, I was a small child. I was in a transport ship with my father between the two planets. Um, our pod, which was like a spherical pod that gets engaged into these larger transport ships where they transport lots of the little pods that you can, they're like little mobile homes, so to speak, um, was ripped from the transport ship, uh, the lights go out, the door opens, lights come in, and I get grabbed and ripped out of this pod and away from my family. And I find the next memory that I have, I'm on a, a lava moon um, in which it's very blackened and dark, and there's volcanic areas, 
There's places where lava flows and rivers through the surface of the moon. And at certain points in time, a planet rises on the horizon. So the moon is orbiting and also rotating this larger planet. But at the time that the, the planet starts to rise, we're taken in and put into these barracks. But what we're doing there is we're actually in these giant mech warrior suits in which we're actually mining for meteorites on this lava moon. So we're finding places where meteorites, the crystalline metal has embedded itself in the surface and using these giant robotic suits that are about three stories high, you know, you strap in, you, you wear all of the components of it to actually mine these meteorites out. And, and then we go into barracks and we're there with a lot of other slaves from many, many different species. And our captors are these beings who uh, look like humanoid lizards slash humanoid reptiles, kind of like uh, a raptor in a human body with a little bit shorter of a muzzle. Some of them are larger and much more muscular. Uh, some of them even have wings um, and others are more uh, smaller and their physical body and physiology is just uh, less strong and um, a lot of the, the technology was very dirty. Uh, lots of pipes and lots of conduits and oil on surfaces, um, uh, strange electrical systems and that kind of thing. And so to make a, a sort of long story short in the journey of what happened to me on that planet, um, myself and a, a small group of others that were there uh, re who are friends of mine in this lifetime and who I managed to confirm all this information with uh, spontaneously. And uh, just to give you a hint of that story, I arrived back um, on the East Coast after being on the West Coast and, and, and having a series of dreams of these memories in which I had the same dream every night, three nights in a row. And um, I was working with uh, someone who's who has a very, very deep background in black ops and in um, a lot of uh, the stuff that's gone down on this planet and knows about a lot of the, the secret and kind of exopolitical work that's happened on this planet. And I was actually working with him, helping to protect the space because we were, we were working on building this company um, to release these nano ceramic building materials uh, to the public. Um, that was an amazing environmental building material. And um, there were psychic attacks happening on the place. And I got sick of it um, because they were affecting our computer systems. It was shutting down stuff in the houses. And one night I just, I just, something shifted in me and I said, no. And I set a ward. I called in all my powers and all my ancestors and my magic. And I set this field around the house. And suddenly I felt everything shift. I went to sleep and that night and for the next three nights, I had the same dreams in a row. And they were the dreams of these, this series of events that I'm sharing with you. And when I finally went back to the East Coast after this experience, and all the attacks stopped, by the way, when that happened. When I went back to the East Coast, the first thing that happens, I go to this party and a friend of mine says, oh my God, Adam, I've been having these dreams. I need to talk to you. <laughs> and he sits me down by the fire and he says, so we were in these robotic mech warrior like vehicles <laughs> digging meteorites out of some like planet. And I was like, okay, we need to talk. And he was the first. And then several others, my, one of my business partners and my company, Superluminal, um, and another one of my collaborators in Superluminal, who was a blue skinned being at that time, um, all have confirmed memories of these events. And basically what we did was the blue skinned being friend of ours, who we later found out was Pleiadian. Um, he had figured out how to translate their, uh, their communication system and actually how to hack their data systems. And so he figured out how to hack their data. And then we learned how to take control of some of their communications and their piloting systems and their ships from this hack. And so at an opportune time, uh, we uploaded this hack into their communication systems. 
We take hold of some of their basic transport and protection ships, and we ride these ships over to this mothership that is nearby the area where we do the mining. And now this mothership, interestingly enough, is a giant black half dome structure. And it's got these orange layers of lights. And this thing is absolutely massive. And we dock with this thing. We upload this virus. We have to kill these reptilian guys that are attacking us. And we upload this virus. And then suddenly all their alarm systems go down and their communications for the whole mothership is down. And at that point, we realize we've just got to get to this freighter ship that we can use to go pick everybody up. And so we, we steal this freighter ship. We go down to the planet. We blow up some of their turrets so they can't shoot us down. And we dock and we go in and we save a lot of the, these women that had uh, different genetic experiments being done on them. Some of their children, which were actually hybrids, and, and some were not hybrids, just children being experimented on, um, and many, many other miners um, that were being forced and enslaved to do mining on this lava. We bring them out, we get them in the freighter ship, we take off, and we realize we don't have many supplies. So we look in their mapping system, we end up stopping at a small outpost. Uh, nearby this volcanic moon. And this outpost um, has this, is kind of a giant mushroom structure looking object. And um, I'm not sure what sci fi movie it is in, but I've seen someone did a, an, a, a model of this kind of ship and it looked, or this kind of space station, and it looked very, very similar to the one in our memories. Um, but we basically invaded this this uh, star station. We took as much food supplies as we could, and we also took um, elements like energy pods and things like that that were used to power this ship in its travel. So we took off from the space station after we'd raided them, um, and we managed to get away and, and head off into open space. And what we realized is that this transport ship can't jump. In other words, it can't go faster than light and leap to another star system, either because of a lack of the right energy conduits or the right level of energy system, or the ship is just not capable of it. Um, and so we know we have to basically use their normal engines to basically travel, propel ourselves through space to try to get to another nearby planet or star where hopefully we can get some more resources and figure out where we're going because <laughs> we have to find our way back to our home world. And so we travel off into empty space and we head towards this, this gas giant that's in their navigation systems. And as we fly up on this gas giant, we realize there is nothing around it. There is no space stations. There are no ships. We are out in the middle of nowhere, and us and this crew that we have of a couple hundred people, you know, have used up almost all of our food supplies, almost all of our energy supplies, and we don't know what to do next. At this point, I realize I have to go back and I have to tell them uh, that we don't have any food left and we don't know what we're going to do next, and that, you know, at least we're going to die free, <laughs> you know? And, um, so I'm kind of harding myself to deal with this situation. And my friend, who is the blue skinned guy, um, says, wait a minute. And he's in this meditative space. And the way that he describes it to me was that he was in a space of blue crystal fire, like this endless hall of, of energy. And he's a programmer in this life. And he says that sometimes he goes into this space of this blue crystal fire where he's able to just flow with programming. Like he's able to literally just write programs and code and it just flows through him from this place. And he said that in that moment, he was asking for help. He was sending a stream out into the galaxy and saying, here we are, we're right here. We need your help. Is there anybody out there who can help us? Like we're going to starve to death and we're going to die out here if you don't come. And um, so I'm basically at a point where I'm about to go back and let everybody know. And suddenly something happens. This blue light 
pours in the windows and it just cascades into the windows of our transport ship. And it's, it's like this massive blue disc that gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And there's these tiny little light blue cracks on the bottom of this massive, massive blue disc. And there's these other little light, ships or something that start flying around our ship and we're like whoa what is going on and the next thing you know this this giant blue disc is so big that it starts to literally envelop us and these tiny little blue cracks on the bottom of it become entire massive canyons and so our ship is swallowed into these giant canyons that just go on and on with like thousands of levels of light you know, running through them and ships flying through them and we're pulled in and we dock inside the side of this, this giant ship and it, it docks softly as if the ship was alive and it reaches out these tendrils of um, cartilage or something to like suction us to the side and we don't know what to do. I mean, so we grab this insect like you know lacquered reptilian armor that we have you know from some of the reptilians we'd stole it off of we grab their swords we grab our guns we grab all this stuff and we, we get armored to the teeth to roll into this giant ship that came out of nowhere and my blue skin friend is like what are you guys doing like I, it's okay it's okay i know it's okay and we're like how do you know and he, he couldn't explain it. He didn't know how to explain it to us. And so as a group of warriors, we rolled into this mothership. We walked down this long hall tunnel and the tunnel is like slowly morphing from five sides to the tunnel, to six, to seven, to eight, and on and on until it's just a perfect ring. And at a perfect ring, it opens into this atrium. And the atrium has this beautiful sacred geometry tiled floor, multiple balconies, and the ceiling has this blue lotus shape and this giant, what looks like a red strawberry with gold lacing around it, illuminating this whole space. And up on one of the balconies, there's three beings standing up there, and they're hooded and cloaked. And one of them is this very, very tall blue being, and it's got a veil over its face, standing and just holding presence and kind of this long either head or hat that it's wearing. Um, and I had a, I had a deep, deep moment uh, when I watched the movie fifth, the fifth element um, because the woman Plava Laguna, who is the uh, opera singer in that movie is stunningly close to, you know, the presence of this being that I felt up there that we saw Next to her is this being in white, um, and it's interesting. It's actually almost like a, what we would describe of on Earth as a, a Ku Klux Klan kind of outfit, um, but it has kind of pointed shoulders and this like conic hat, little slits for eyes, but it's got all this beautiful gold lacing um, and star patterns and things like that. And then next to this being is a green being who has more like bug-like eyes, and its head folds into these two different lobes and goes back um, almost like insect wings. And um, they're standing and holding presence and we come in, we walk into the center of the room. And at the moment we get to the center, another door opens on the other side and out that door walks this woman with an entourage behind her. And she is just incredibly graceful. It looks like she's floating across the room to us. And she comes right up to me and she's very short, but she's got this incredibly elaborate headdress and dress on just fantastically elaborate and comes up to me and these piercing bright blue eyes and this light whitish blue skinned face looks at me and she points right at my heart and puts her hand up and she says, be disarmed. You are welcome here. And for the first time in a long, long time, it was the feeling of really letting down my guard and letting down my armor and, you know, being enslaved on this reptilian moon and battling my way out and going through all of the intensity of, of that experience was like, 
it was like suddenly I was in a place where I was finally safe and there was somebody that I could trust. And this woman who came into the space, she is one of the people in my transpersonal uh, work. And she remembers being this uh, galactic ambassador and meeting us at this time and that kind of thing. Um, and these people that I'm speaking of, um, I'm working on getting permission from all of them to share their names um, in the book project. And so once I have permission from as many of them as I can get it from, and some may still want to be anonymous, um, we'll actually reference all these individuals in the book project so you can see the specific people um, that had and contributed to different parts of this, um, this history. Uh, recall, <laughs> let's just call it. Um, and so <clears throat> at that point, uh, we had a, a very, very interesting transition. You know, we, we suddenly were safe, we had food, we, our whole lives changed, and we, we realized that there was all these other species around the galaxy we'd never even imagined before. And we eventually, you know, we really wanted to know what, what happens with our planets, what's going on with the raids, you know, like what's, what's happened to our people. And um, in many cases, they would tell us, uh, but for the Shihali, those of us who were of the Shihali species, they waited a very long time before they told us that our Earth-like planet was entirely destroyed. It was completely overrun. It was, um, you know, just been completely mined and just eaten away all of the resources um, and was just, uh, just like a hollow shell and no longer, no longer livable. And the desert-like planet that we had um, and that we populated cities in the mountains and in underground areas, um, that planet was still holding off the reptilian raids, but that there were ships still coming and attacking and there are basically sieges going on all over that planet. Um, where the reptilians were taking what they could, but they were trying to get into our cities because that's where the gates were to the underground crystal caverns and all the real wealth of the planet was in those locations. And so um, we, once we heard that, we were like, well, let's go do something. Let's stop them. We have these huge ships. Here's the mother ship. You know, you guys have this whole galactic fleet. Like, why aren't you stopping this assault from happening? And you know, what they told us is they said that um, that this is some part of our own species' journey and that we have to, it's, it's some part of us establishing ourselves as strong enough to face off these reptilians and also that we're warriors and they're not warriors. Like, they don't know, they, they're not used to battle. They didn't come from a place or lifetimes, you know, and, and species and planets where they had to battle other species. You know, there wasn't, there wasn't an army in the galaxy, so to speak, that could just go and raid this planet. And so what we assessed with them is we figured out that, that the reptilians believed that the dragons were their gods. And this is a very, very important piece of the story. So I'm going to say it again. The reptilians believed that the dragons, like giant dragons, the dragons of our mythology, the dragons that are these massive beings, sometimes with huge wings, sometimes without, they believed they were their gods and they, they honored the dragons and worshiped the dragons as gods. And this is going to become a very, very important piece of the story later on in our interview. So just making a bookmark there for you. Um, and so what we figured out was they had this technology on this mothership that, um, that had been designed and, and what it was able to do is you wear this, uh, like a belt, um, this belt buckle that's on your Dantian, you know, your lower center down here. And the belt buckle can basically act as a holographic projection system for your body. And so what it does is it literally rearranges matter. Um, and the way we might understand it now is like if you had a bunch of nanobots that could reassemble a bunch of matter around your body and make your body look like whatever you wanted it to, like some really incredible costuming, right? Except that in this case, it's actually assembling materials in space-time 
And it's actually assembling those materials so that your consciousness is inside this body and experiences this embodiment fully as if it was yours. And so if you, if you transform your body into a much, much larger physiological structure, you have to eat just like that physiological structure eats. And so we decided that we were going to become dragons and we were going to go down and assault this planet and show up as dragons and show up as their gods and see if we could stop the assault and the raid from occurring. And so that's exactly what we did. <clears throat> we flew in on light ships all over the planet in a coordinated assault. You know, the giant gates opened. And I remember very, very viscerally, as well as some of my other friends, remember this moment as, as this plasma-like dust <clears throat> flows into the ships as it's opening for the first time. And we activate these, these uh, belt buckles. And our bodies literally morph and necks grow and snouts grow and horns come off of us and spikes come off our backs and huge wings and massive claws. And our bodies grow into these giant dragons of many, many different colors, gemstones, metals. Um, and we run out into the desert like we're charging out in Burning Man or something in the the desert wind is blowing on us and we run up to this wave of reptilian soldiers and we roar at them and charge them and roar at them and they look at us and they look at each other and they look at us and they drop their weapons and the leaders get down on their hands and knees and they bow down to us because they believe that we're their gods and so they stop the assault and we managed to communicate with them to tell them they had to get off of this planet and not come back. And so many of them left at this time, but many of them did not leave at this time. Many of them stayed on the planet. Many of them decided that they're, they were going to challenge their gods because this was a deep part of the reptilian culture is challenging authority, overcoming that which is bigger than you to prove how big you are how strong you are to prove that you are a dragon lord. This was the way that the reptilians culture was framed, very similar to um, in Star Trek, uh, the Klingons, I believe, have a similar kind of cultural, sociocultural structure, which is like you fight and you compete to become stronger and to move up the ranks. So I believe Gene Roddenberry tapped into some of this at that time that he was writing those stories as well. And and so while we couldn't get all of them off the planet right away, we did continue to assault them and battle them and face off with these small groups that hung out. And after a few months, we eventually were managed to get all of these beings off of our planet and actually um, clear the Shihali worlds from the dragon raids that had occurred, at least the desert planet. And at this time, when this happened, it was a massive massive reunion point, um, a reunion for those of us who had been in dragon bodies for months trying to face off these reptilian assaults. We couldn't transform back into humanoid form for months because if they had seen any of us do that, they would have known it was a farce and they'd have come right back. They had to believe that we were dragons all the way. And so we reunited with our species. You know, when this was done, we were able to take off our dragon cloaks and in the courtyards of this one Shihali city, uh, my friends and I remember taking off our dragon forms and finding out that <clears throat> many of our family members had already died in the wars, but that others who remembered us, you know, acknowledged us and welcomed us. And it was also a reunion for the Shihali with the rest of the galactic community, because once we freed our planet, the galactic starships came and they all came down and joined us. And we had this massive party and many of the Shihali discovered that because of their technology, because of them saving this group of miners from this lava moon and because of the, the holographic projection systems allowing us to do these dragon bodies, um, we basically were able to free the species. And so the Shihali felt this immense debt for the Galactic Council or Federation as it was at that time. 
And so many, many, many of the Shihali at that time swore to be guardians and protectors for this council of beings who were all peaceful, all beautiful, you know, didn't deal with planetary wars or interplanetary wars. And the Shihali had been training and fighting their whole lives, you know, generations of warriors. And, and so this, this deep oath of guardianship that the Shihali took for the Galactic Council led to the founding of the first galactic guardianship uh, orientation group, which was basically the founding of the Jedi. And uh, a new hub for the Jedi was set up on this planet in the Orion system, also in the Orion system, that was a massive interplanetary hub for different species and different beings from different worlds. And this hub was set up with training grounds to train the Jedi, um, and there were also schools and academies set up on many different worlds to where the Shihali would go and they would gather those youth, those individuals who had a natural gift or inclination to, to challenge authority, to, um, to move with their body, to practice martial arts, to practice warriorship skills in different ways, and that had a guardianship uh, feel to them, um, we, we would find them, we'd bring them in, and we began training them. And so we began creating this massive fleet of these galactic guardians or Jedi um, all over the galaxy. And now uh, I'll just mention here at a point that the word Jedi is really interesting. There's a couple different possible roots for this word. Uh, one of them, which I believe is probably the most substantial origins, is Egyptian in nature. And it comes from the root word Jed. And Jed is spelled D-J-E-D. And the Jed represents a pillar that connects all the layers of the universe. And the symbol of the Jed has a base, and the base represents the foundation of all that is, the foundation of all existence. And then as you go up the pillar of the Jed, it's got these rings at the top, and these three rings symbolize your physical, your emotional, and your mental worlds. And the Egyptians had their own terminology for each of these realms, but it's the gross, the etheric, and the astral, the physical, emotional, and mental. And then the top of the pillar is its connection to absolute spirit, infinite source. So the pillar really represents being totally interconnected with everything that you are and being totally present with it, supporting what exists. What do pillars do? They hold up the roof, they create space, they, they hold a gateway at the entrance to a temple. And so the Jed was the symbol of those who held that space for others who brought the magic that contains what needs to be created. And so there are stories of these magi known as the Jedi, uh, D-J-E-D-H-I is often how it's spelled. And the Jedi uh, were this group of magi who basically um, had this, these different magical technologies and skills and ceremonial practices that they would use to help onboard and protect different temples throughout Egypt. Um, there's also some stories that a Magi named Jedi taught the pharaohs how to build the pyramids. Uh, but for those of you that have any interest in um, archaeology and have explored a little bit about like what it might actually take to build the pyramids, um, you might find that there's still there's some extraterrestrial correlation here, some deeper correlation with magic and with a level of technology and consciousness that goes back prior to what we're familiar with in our traditional archaeological studies. So the city-like planet um, was thriving. There was libraries uh, being created recording the history of the Shihali new Jedi temples forming around the galaxy, but the reptilians were not done. It, they were not complete with this time of conflict, and they began assaulting additional worlds throughout the Orion system um, and other worlds nearby the Shihali home planet uh, to begin with. 
And so as they began to assault these other worlds, they were taking slaves, they were capturing them, they were setting up mining complexes, and many, many people were captured and held in these different mining complexes. Others of us, the Jedi that were forming, would go in and we'd assault these different mining complexes and try to, our best to extract the people and the slaves that were captured inside these complexes and bring them back um, out to, uh, to safety and to other planets. And we'd also do our best to destroy the mining complexes when possible, but in a lot of cases, they were deeply interconnected with massive, uh, very, very rich environmental structures. So you couldn't just blow them up. You couldn't just destroy them. Um, and so it was a very, very difficult time to figure out how do we battle all of these reptilians and, and, and clear these different uh, planets when it's just this like a nonstop onslaught. Um, and what we realized they were doing was they'd taken the concept that they had used earlier with us in which we were strapped into these giant mech warrior like vehicles and mining these moons for them. They'd, they'd then uh, established that into entire armies of robots run on AI. And these entire robot armies, you know, massive armies of mech warrior like vehicles, humanoid like robots, were literally, you know, heading off the assaults, attacking planets. So it didn't matter how many of them you knocked out, unless you could hit the control hubs where the programs were being used to run all of these robots, they were just going to keep coming and keep coming and keep coming. And this period of time, um, I look at in George Lucas's uh, storyline as uh, the period of time in which the Trade Federation is doing these different assaults on these wealthy worlds. Um, in the uh, episode one, you see all these robot armies coming in and assaulting Naboo, um, which is where Princess Amidala is from. And as she, they're assaulting these lands, you know, it's just all of these people that beings of flesh and blood are having to fight all of these robots. Um, and it's very, very challenging. And these kinds of assaults continued and got more and more massive as the reptilians were spreading throughout the galaxy um, or throughout the Orion system. So well, at some juncture in this process, uh, what happens is an individual in the Galactic Federation uh, comes to the council and says, I have a solution. I have an army of beings. And this army of beings is ready to go. They're, uh, they're a young planet. They were about to go interplanetary. They're already tra trained as warriors. And they can come in and they can help us. And so what happens is we're like, well, great, you know, awesome. I mean, and then another whole planet of warriors, like that's what we need. You know, we need some serious, serious armies here. And so they bring this army and this army of soldiers comes in and they start coordinating with us as we do these different attacks on planets, assaulting reptilian hubs you know, coming in to try to stop assaults that were already in progress on different planets. And there were many, many standoff battles and different battles that occurred between our forces, um, these galactic stormtroopers, and, the, and these reptilian robot armies that were coming in and assaulting us. And this is basically uh, the period of time in George Lucas's drama that he calls the Clone Wars. Now, I haven't watched uh, any of these Clone Wars cartoons, but I, I have some people I know that said they're really awesome and fun to watch. Um, so I do hope to check them out at some point just to see some more of the correlations that exist uh, during some of the narrative of what's going on during that time with what happens. But they're not clones. They're actually beings from this other planet. And um, at some point, uh, just turn uh, yeah I'll just stay here for a second and say that um, at some point basically what goes down is during a massive coordinated assault on many many different planets in which many of these uh, soldiers from this this planetary system are with us 
and doing the assault with us on the robot armies, attacking the programming hubs, going after the reptilians as much as we can all over the place, something happens and all of a sudden, all, all of the soldiers fighting for us suddenly turn on us. And so the Jedi are now very, very few, a couple leaders, you know, in each one of these different assault teams um, and their assault teams all over all these different planetary systems. And then suddenly they all turn on the Jedi and begin slaughtering the Jedi and uh, begin taking over the planets right alongside all the robot armies. And what we figured out happened, um, what I figured out happened later after having this very, very crushing, intense memory uh, with many others uh, who remember this time and remembered um, the immense fear and the death that occurred, the, the losing of families, you know, the massive feeling of betrayal from the Galactic Federation itself, like somebody betrayed us from the inside. Um, but what we unpacked happened was that whoever this was that had set up this and invited this super soldier species to come and fight with us, they had actually gone to this planet, you know, years before, probably earlier in the reptilian assaults, and they showed up at this planet, and this is the planet of the Zeta Reticuli. This is the planet of the Greys. And they show up for the greys and they say, Hey, you know, we, we see that you guys are having a little trouble, you know, breaking past this last piece of your, your growth. And you're, you're about to be interplanetary. You're about to have all these skills. Would you like this special technology that you can use to awaken your telepathic capacities as a species? That was their block. They were having trouble with the telepathic world and you need telepathic ability to be able to pilot faster than light starships. This is a very, very critical component as well in the history. And so the Zeta said, sure, let's do it. Or the council of Zeta that they had been speaking with, this uh, ambassador um, who betrayed the Galactic Council. And so what the technology was, was chips that could be installed in the back of your head. And so it went out like wildfire. The Zetas spread these chips like crazy. And, you know, the idea was if you put these chips in your head, you can access the Internet with your mind. Think about that. I mean, even if this happened on Earth, can you imagine how many people would jump on it before, before we realized it could be a problem? If you install a chip into your brain and you're able to access Google with your mind, call someone with your mind, chat with people in your mailing list with your mind, access computer systems with your mind, that, that technology massively accelerated life for the Zetas. But there was a fundamental problem. The problem was those chips had a back door. And that back door was used to insert very, very specific data into their brains, and it was very subtle. They would wake up in the morning and be like, wow, you know, I wish there was something I could do more to, like, serve my, my species. Maybe I should join the military. You know, and the females and the children would wake up with their chips, and they'd be like, oh, yeah, dad needs to join the army. Dad needs to join the military. Like, that would be a good thing for him to do. And so in a very, very short time, all of a sudden, most of the species suddenly becomes militarized. Uh, all the men began joining armies. All the different businesses become businesses within a militarized structure. And, and in a very, very short time, the entire Zeta Reticuli species is programmed as a hive mind to be a massive super soldier species, a clone army, so to speak. And many of them lost so much of their individuality in this process, which is why I think the, the channel came through George Lucas to call them clones or to actually tell the story as if they're clones. What's very interesting too, when you look at the movie in Star Wars, I believe it's uh, episode two where this occurs, 
the planet that Obi-Wan Kenobi visits where they're making the clone soldiers is run by what kind of being? Well, they look just like greys, but they're very, very tall, skinny, slender greys. Um, and so a piece of that puzzle was there in the movies as well. Um, but he just didn't, he didn't get the exact translation correctly, which is what happens for a lot of the great sci-fi writers and authors. They're just letting it come through, but there's not, they're not trying to filter it. They're not trying to block it out. They're not trying to, you know, decide what was true or because it's all just coming as a flood of memory and they're doing their best to write it down as fast as they can. So the entire Zeta reticuli species gets programmed together to a hive mind of clone soldiers. They are recruited to help us fight off the robot armies around the galaxy, and then they turn on us, and the next thing you know, you have the first galactic empire. And at the point where this galactic empire is imposed, it's imposed by force on planets all over and it's held in place by all these stormtrooper armies, um, which are these clone armies. It's held in place by all these robot armies and by these massive motherships that park themselves near planetary systems, um, what George Lucas called the Death Stars. And, uh, you know, at, just as I described earlier, where they had a half dome shaped mothership controlling all of the processes happening on the mining complex. Well, they eventually learned how to turn those half dome structures into full spheres, and they literally had full spherical like moon structures that had the power to destroy entire planets. And so during this period of time, many of the Jedi, the guardians, were either killed, had been gone into hiding, or they had their families being threatened by reptilian high lords. And they knew unless they served the empire, unless they turned and served the empire, their families were going to be killed. Entire planets were going to be killed in some cases. They were ruthless about it. So many, many of the Jedi from that time have a very, very deep internal pain around this time because they, many of them had to so-called serve the dark side. They became the Sith. They became these Jedi lords that were doing the work of the Empire to protect people that they loved. And going through the deep and intensive pain of self-conflict involved with that. But some of us, you know, even in the darkest places of our pain and our loss in those experiences, we were doing our best to feed little bits of information when we could to these alliances that began to show up alliances of species of all types um, who are coming together and actually forging resistance against this empire. And this rebel alliance gained strength and gained strength. And this is the story that you see in Star Wars episodes uh, four, five, and six. And it's this rise of these beautiful beings coming in to take back their galaxy against all odds. I mean, against incredible odds. I mean, these were not warriors, most of these people, but they were becoming warriors. They were becoming guardians because they had to. And because the entire galaxy was filled with these stormtroopers and these robot armies and these reptilian hubs. And so um, over time, the Rebel Alliance continued to gain strength and, and we were able to feed with them certain little bits of information, such as how to hack the reptilian mainframes and how to shut down their communication systems, just like we'd done on the lava moon, and also how to destroy these death stars that could destroy worlds and that were literally running the frequencies and the programs that were keeping the robot armies going and keeping all of these stormtroopers programmed to the same kinds of commands. And so we basically, uh, the, the Rebel Alliance basically gained enough strength to finally face off the Empire and begin destroying some of the most critical points, um, some critical, critical battle stations. And as they destroyed those Death Stars, the programs for all the robot armies shut down and all the Zeta Reticuli soldiers that were being programmed and held to their missions that program ceased 
And so all of a sudden, you have shut down robots everywhere, and all the guys who are supposed to be the guards for the empire are like, what are we doing? What's happening? What's going on? They're, they're confused. They don't know what's happening. They've had this information stream being fed into their heads consistently for years and years and years. And suddenly, they don't even know who they are anymore. And this is the point at the end of, uh, of Return of the Jedi, you know, when some of the largest uh, programming hubs are destroyed and the galaxy finally has its first great celebrations of peace because so many, uh, all these robot armies, so many of these uh, clone soldier armies are all shut down. And there's no longer a massive, massive force that can enforce the will of the empire. And so all the planets where those beings had been uh, become freed. And this is an interesting juncture because this is the point where these new, this new series is about to start that's coming out. Um, and this new Star Wars series, we're going to get to see well, like what happened, what happened after that from the perspective of George Lucas's channel in the storyline of what went down. But I can tell you right now, as a, as a secret tip of what we remember happened prior to that, and then we can together have this very interesting adventure of seeing whether or not it correlates and whether or not some of these different uh, pieces of what we remember are being mapped in Disney's version of the next Star Wars series. Now so that's, that's pretty fun. Now that's going to be very, very interesting to see the correlation of George Lucas with Disney, whether there's a, a divergence mm -hmm. there, because we know that Disney mm -hmm. rejected George Lucas's story suggestions because they had bought out his mm -hmm. And mm. and uh, so please please right. please continue with the narrative. Yeah, I would be happy to. And you know, I just have to say, uh, it makes me very sad to hear that they blocked some of his suggestions on the story because I don't necessarily trust Disney's capacity to tell the galactic story as it happened. But George Lucas did a pretty good job. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll see how well it actually reflects real events or if they just go full Hollywood and it's all Hollywooded out just to have more battles and whatever. But, um, you know, things didn't, things were not immediately easy right afterwards. You have to remember the scale that we're talking about here as we talk about reconciliation. We're talking about you know, the Orion system, which is not even a system, by the way, it's many, many different star systems. And these star systems are many, many, many light years apart. You know, when you look at the belts in Orion, those three stars in a the belt, they look like they're all pretty close together, right? But they're not. The two on the sides of the belt are actually pretty close to us, meaning, you know, in the realm of 100 light years away. Whereas the, the star in the very center of the belt is actually two stars and it's over 400 light years away. It's like way, way, way further back. And so, you know, there's, there's all these interesting uh, levels of depth and scale that you gain when you start to realize you're talking about a community of species across many planetary systems and star systems that are hundreds to thousands of light years apart. And the, at this point, you know, the technology on, at the galactic scale has been for a very, very long time already superluminal. They've already had the ability to travel faster than light. So getting from one planet to another, jumping here to there, you know, hitting light speed is really not that big of a deal. Um, but not all species in the galaxy developed that technology by this time. Only those that were part of this uh, connected galactic community. And the reptilians were just figuring out different ways to jump different distances between stars. So they weren't immediately on the far end of the galaxy. They were mainly spreading in a coordinated format, placing their moons, you know, their death stars in different junctures, coming with their battle stations, coming in and assaulting worlds after worlds, 
you know, building this whole um, empire out from, from a core. But once they had the clone soldiers and once they had the robot armies and some people in place in the Galactic Federation, they were able to jump massively to other star systems. And that's how this galactic empire, so to speak, was put into place. But we're talking about a huge scale of worlds. And so while many of the worlds were freed during the period of this time when these big Death Stars were destroyed, there were some areas, backwood zones, you know, where it was still a deep conflict. There were still Imperial supporters. There were still entire groups that believed the Empire was what the galaxy needed. Um, and so there was other layers of conflict that were to happen um, between the, the, um, the guardians that remained um, and, and some of these other beings. Uh, and, and also, there was the problem of the reptilians themselves. How do we get these reptilians back to their home planet? How do we stop them from this continued assault between worlds? And so what happened was, one, we began to basically return the builds of the Jedi. We began to cultivate the Jedi again. And we created entire new academies and fleets of training and guardian training at a galactic scale because we lost so many people during the Orion Wars. And so there, there began to be a whole new uh, suite of Jedi, uh, the force awakening in many beings, so to speak, um, all over the galaxy. And the second thing was a really critical piece of technology, some of which we actually figured out based on how they were building these Death Stars and also how they were running the shields on these things. And what we eventually figured out how to do was create what we call planet shield technologies. We learned how to create these impenetrable force fields, which literally could surround an entire planet or planetary system and actually act as a gate and be opened in very, very specific locations um, to allow ships to pass in and out of these massive, massive force uh, fields or planet shields that were created. And once we could create that, we were, we were empowered to actually begin to isolate the reptilians where they were and push them back towards their home planet and create a quarantine around their planetary system where they could live and they could enjoy and they could rape all their worlds that they wanted to in their own system, <laughs> but they weren't going to be affecting and influencing and spreading um, across the galaxy, trying to take, uh, take resources and take lives and enslave other species. Um, so that was a big, big stage. And then there was the stage of restoring the Zetas, because you have all of these clone soldiers, so to speak, but they're different people. You know, they're just all been programmed to be these warriors. And so a massive coordinated effort was done to bring a lot of these stormtroopers, clone soldiers back to the Zeta Reticuli system and begin a process with them of overcoming their programming. So, you know, creating some schools, creating some opportunities for them to, to learn about themselves. And one of the things that arose was the awareness that there was this planet that was a very small developing planet um, called Earth, well, not called Earth, but we call it Earth. Um, and on this planet, there was, uh, there was a species developing there that had incredible individuality. In other words, so much emotional character and so much individualized nature to all of these different beings um, that were evolving on this planet. And so the Zetas were encouraged to study humanity in particular um, to start to see like what is emotion why is it why is individual emotion different from collective emotion and what does it mean to be an individual being and so um, for literally you know 13,000 years uh, at least the Zetas have been studying humankind be coming to earth participating with humans in different ways engaging with humans at times just as many of the other galactic species out there have been. Um, but that's another story. Uh, but this gives us a little bit of context for why the experimentation, 
why some of the abductions all the way up until recent times, and also why did the abductions stop at some point? Why did the study stop? And also, what's the situation with the hybrid children? Why are there hybrids? Why are the Zetas so interested in working out their own genetic challenges through merging their genome with humanity? And this is the key to all of it, is understanding that they were the Borg. They had a hive, a hive mind. They were all programmed, and they've been for thousands and thousands of years working their way out from that deep state of collective hive programming and coming back into individualization by, with themselves. And so at this time juncture, a galactic council is also forged. It's no longer appropriate to call it a republic because at this point we realize that, that you know, as long as there's a republic and there's some kind of collective decision-making engine, then there could always be deception. One group could come in, sway the whole collective, and the next thing you know, you know, you've got an army that's been generated on a little planet that's now assaulting the entire galaxy, and you end up with the Galactic Empire. So the new way the Galactic Council is forged is as an alliance of free worlds. It's, it's all, every world, every part of, every community that participates in this Galactic Council are sovereign and independent, but to be a part of this alliance and this family means that they share very specific collective values. And some of these collective values are things that we're realizing are really the critical values to establish, to, to create an entire planet in a state of peace here on Earth. And one of the foremost ones I wanna to touch on is open source. The principle of open source resolves so many conflicts, it's ridiculous. When you have two nation states that are battling, two different communities on a planet that are battling, or two different planets that are battling, what are they battling for? They're often battling for resources or information that the other individual has that they want. They either want their resources or they wanna impose their own ideas on some other species or their way of being on some other species. So the, the right of open source and sovereignty is that you can create whatever you want, but create whatever you want and give it away. If you give it away, then whatever they want, they already have. They can have it for free, for nothing, it's theirs. They can have the technology, they can have the thing. If they already have it, they have, there's no power balance that's in place. And, and the other thing, or so rather, let me restate that and say, if you give away what it is that you have to others, instead of keeping it secret and instead of keeping it to yourself, then there's nothing that they really need from you. They already have what it is that you need to give. And so there is a balance of power already in place. And, and this is really critical and crucial as we look at the economic changes and the social changes happening on planet Earth, and we see that the open source projects that exist are really the ones that are leading the pack in doing new developments because they're not trying to take stuff and steal stuff and corporate espionage or nation espionage just to know what the other group's doing. If people on, around planet Earth were more open and transparent about their activities, we wouldn't have to have billion dollar in, you know, uh, intelligence complexes that are constantly trying to control the information flow. The information flow would be open. And when the information flow is open and the resource flow is also open because you develop technologies like replicators, and the energy flow is also open because you have new energy systems running on the fabric of space-time itself, vacuum-based engines. And you also have the freedom of space to travel to whatever planet you wanna to travel to. Well, right there, you've knocked off the four big reasons why we go into conflict here on Earth. And they're also the big reasons why we've had a lot of conflict in the galaxy. Why did the reptilians assault all of these worlds? Well, there was a piece that is a deep emotional trauma, and we're going to talk about that here a little bit more in just a minute. 
but the the other than the emotional trauma, they needed resources. They didn't have replication systems. They were taking planets to take resources and expand their empire. They weren't part of a community of open source participants. So this, this galactic council that formed at this time really changed the dynamics around the galaxy. And it opened up a whole new level of, of communing between worlds because if anybody progressed and anybody gained really amazing new abilities or new tech, everybody gained it. It was shared everywhere. And so this really established a comprehensive level of peace across the galaxy. And, uh, and at least within all of the Alliance worlds, there are still many worlds that are growing up just like us humans here on earth that have not become, you know, fully interstellar species yet. Um, and we, you know, every species has to go through its own process of growth and development. It can't be given by a galactic species. It can't be that, that freedom of becoming a galactic species can't be taken away by another species that's already galactic. Because when that happens, you know, if they came and landed with starships today and just gave everybody all this tech and all of these starships, everybody would believe that they were like our gods or something. They're angels from heaven. They just gave us all of this stuff and we didn't have to do any of it ourselves. They just gave it to us and then we're galactic too, right? But we'd always resent that because as humans, we like, and not just as humans, as beings, we like to create our own. We like to do it ourselves. We like to get there and be like, yeah, we got there. We did it. And um, so I'm just kind of foreshadowing and touching on a few of the other pieces of, of, you know, how this relates to the present moment and the galactic situation that we're in right now at this time. So do you have any questions uh, so far, well, Alfred, I, or I we do, can bridge I, to another part at this point or not? Yeah, I do, but I'd like to leave them to the end. I, I, I'd like to okay. kind of go through the whole flow and then ask yeah. questions at the end. I've been marking down questions. Great, great. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about the healing process then that began to go down. And let's, let's dive a little bit deeper into the roots of some of the really fundamental questions. Like, why did this whole thing happen? What, what went down? What was going on in these reptilians' minds? Why did they attack and assault all of these worlds? What was the problem? This is a piece that you won't find anywhere. And it's, a, and it's still a critical problem right now because right now you have all of these people who are channeling all these memories of reptilians and they're claiming, you know, our government beings are reptilians and there's these, all these reptilian forces and they're coming in and they're in earth already and they're attacking us and we're scared of them and they're bad guys, you know, and they're trying to control us and do this stuff to us. Why? Why? Why are they? And what makes them bad? And why do we have this concept of what they're doing is bad? Besides the fact that we're scared of what they've done before and that they might do it again. We have this latent fear that we're going to just be taken over and it's all going to be controlled again. And we're going to be stuck under the thumb of an oppressive empire that's going to cause some kind of worldwide destruction on this planet. We're afraid of losing our planet because for those of us who have been galactic beings, you know, and experienced the same vision as Leia had on the starship with Darth Vader when he, you know, they shoot a planet that Leia was born at and she sees the entire planet get destroyed. That level of grief and pain does not go away in one lifetime or five or 10. The level of grief that is created when you lose an entire planet is one that affects a species a genetic, from a genetic standpoint, from a spiritual standpoint, for a very, very, very long time. And many of us here on Earth right now are still scared that we're going to lose our planet, that they're going to destroy our planet and or that we are going to destroy our planet and and we're afraid of that grief we're afraid of that wound 
being opened again and, and the immense, massive loss that comes with that. So we have to face the fact that this has already happened. This has already happened. This story is of the past. We connect with it. We get inspired by it. We look at the pieces of it because, because it reminds us something about who we are. It reminds us of our strength of overcoming uh, the, you know, challenges of overcoming control, of uniting together, of, of being a rebel alliance that can overcome, you know, great tyranny. And, and that, that inspiration that's inside of us, that's birthed through this work, um, is something that we feel like we can give to other people. And that's why I'm here. That's part of why I'm doing this and sharing this now, because I know that it's time right now for people to receive this information and to begin to apply it to their lives. So what happened with the reptilians? Where did they come from? Why did they attack these worlds and, and what was going on? Well, it wasn't until very, very recently that I finally put together the final pieces of this puzzle and was able to confirm the experiences that, uh, that detail the roots of what happened. Uh, several years ago, I was able to, um, I underwent several experiences of contact with different extraterrestrial species. And in one of those experiences of contact, I was brought astrally to the Arcturian home system. And I was brought into a massive hall um, that the Arcturians had built underground. Uh, many of the cities in the Arcturian home worlds um, are, are underground because the, the air quality of the planet has changed. The, the atmosphere is much, much thinner than it was. It's very much like Mars it has a reddish light because it's close to a giant red star. And um, in one of these caverns underground, which I would describe as being very similar to the mines of Moria in, um, in the J.R.R. Tolkien series, uh, The Lord of the Rings, and, and these massive halls were record halls uh, in which different galactic records were kept in these giant stone tablets and also on these giant wall friezes. And the, I was brought there with this woman who was a prisoner of some kind, or I thought she was a prisoner, and she was walking between these two guards, and she walks to the wall, and she unlocks this thing in this wall, and it shows me this huge picture, and it's like holographic stone structures showing me what went down. And, and she begins crying and apologizing and expressing this very personal apology to me because of whatever personal relationship we had had or spiritual relationship we had had around the roots of what had happened uh, way, 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 way back when in the galaxy when this went down. And what happened was that the Arcturians had stolen DNA from another species. And what I learned about the Arcturians over years of doing galactic research and transpersonal research with people who remember being Arcturians is that they're master geneticists. They figured out the genomes of many, many different species, you know, a very long time ago. They began manipulating their own genetics for a very long time. They've adapted themselves so they look like all kinds of different beings, uh, sometimes animal humanoid hybrids, um, sometimes just different types of humanoids, different structures of humanoids. And what they had done was they had stolen DNA um, from dragon species. And these dragon species were primarily uh, embodied in another galaxy, um, in Andromeda. And what happened was they stole all this dragon DNA, and then they began to create hybrids with this dragon DNA. And they were working to, basically, this, the story that she shared with me was that they were trying to make a bridge between these gracious, massive dragon beings who had such a powerful physical and energetic presence, they could literally move the fabric of space and send ripples through it and move elementals and invoke elementals like fire and water and um, immense power, powerful beings. And, 
and they were trying to somehow build a bridge between these amazing beings and the humanoids, the Arcturians, the Syrians, the Pleiadians, the Shiheli, the Lacrinon, all of these other humanoid-like beings that had a hard time relating to that, that, that nature of consciousness that the dragons had. And so they were creating hybrids and they seeded a planet of these hybrids so that these different hybrids of different species combinations, um, some Arcturian with dragons, some Shihali with dragons, some with Pleiadian with dragon, many, many different kinds. Um, and they were seeded these hybrids and they started a whole civilization. And now the civilization was cool at first you know it was like it was blooming they were it was interesting they were super creative super inventive but there was a problem and the problem comes down to something that is a spiritual principle that uh that my soul family and i have gathered as an understanding over over many years of doing this work which is that there's a very specific kind of travel through the galaxy that we call soul travel and what soul travel is, is when you die and you leave a body and you travel as a soul to another planetary system, sometimes to another galaxy, and you're born into another type of species or another body in order to experience what it's like to be that kind of species. And this is what's happened on planet Earth, is that there have been countless souls who have traveled to planet Earth to be born as humans and experience what it's like to be humans. And we're going to get to that more a little bit later. Um, but for right now, what's really important and relevant is to understand that sometimes if, it's not, if there's not a conscious decision of exactly which body you're going to go into, what will happen is you will follow a natural pattern through your own genetic descendants to the next body that your soul is going to be incarnated into. And so what would happen was that these dragons who were living in Andromeda would die or pass away or leave their body expecting to be born again into their own descendant line, the line of their own children, right? To have their own genetic line preserved and their own genetic families preserved. The dragons, this was part of their culture. But because DNA was stolen from Andromeda and now in the Milky Way galaxy, now being used in this civilization that's being seeded um, near the system of Betelgeuse, there, now all of a sudden there's dragon souls and they're dying, they're leaving Andromeda and they're being born not into dragon bodies, not hatched to beautiful parents into a world of dragons and other beings that are like them but instead into a strange foreign world with a foreign star energy and into these small bodies that were not at all as powerful and graceful as dragon bodies. They were tiny little compacted humanoid dragon bodies and they didn't even know how to use them right. You know, they, it was like weird. And some, some of the hybrid com combinations were, I would say, inappropriate. They didn't work. It didn't mesh well enough. And so they were always angry and they were angry and trying to, and they had forgotten who they were. They're just, why am I in this body? Why am I in this situation? I'm powerful. I'm more powerful than this. I'm going to show you how much more powerful I am. And their whole culture, you know, was, became centered around conflicts that were about showing how powerful you are overcoming others, teaching, uh, you know, I'll show you how powerful I am. I'm the bigger dragon than you are, you know? And so this, this very um, Klingon-like culture that is very, very intensively conflict-oriented was because of both the forgetting of not remembering who they were and being upset about this new embodiment, as well as just the natural process of them trying to somehow regain some part of themselves and some quality in themselves. Now, very recently, I had a very, very deep, deep, deep healing experience. Um, and during this healing experience, I had a spontaneous recall of being born as a dragon in Andromeda. And I remembered coming out of my egg 
and seeing my parents for the first time. And it put together pieces of a puzzle that I've been assembling for a very long time in which a couple from Argentina said they knew me from Andromeda, but we weren't humans and we were some other kind of beings to a friend of mine that I went to Burning Man with many times saying, I know you recruited me from Andromeda and we came to this galaxy together, but I don't understand what happened or why, or why it was so intense when we got here. And, and I'd been piecing together all these parts of the puzzle of where I came from and why. And I finally got the answer when I had this memory of being born as a dragon in Andromeda. Because when I grew up, I saw what went down. I saw that the dragon's DNA had been stolen by this other galactic species, these very strange, different humanoid beings um, who had taken the DNA and were using it um, on their own, just creating all of these beings um, with no respect and no honor for where that information had come from. And we treated our genetics as the most valuable thing that we have. It was our divine encoding, our sacred gift. So to have it just ripped away and stolen, there was massive, massive, massive anger among the dragons. And there were councils that were created. And many of the high dragon lords were so upset that they decided they were going to just die right then and travel to the Milky Way galaxy and teach these humanoids a lesson. They were going to travel, be born as these reptilian beings, these hybrids, and they were going to go through and they were just going to destroy as much of the galaxy as possible. Traveling intergalactically is a little bit more challenging than traveling interstellar, just as a note of context on this. And so soul travel is a much, much easier and faster way to go when you're traveling between galaxies. And so these high dragon lords in their rage were dying, killing themselves, and leaving their bodies and traveling to this galaxy to be born as reptilians. And they were the ones that led those armies of assault to take out as many of these humanoids as they could to cleanse this scourge from the universe, this dishonorable form of being and life. But you know, there's a problem when you do soul travel, and that's that you don't always remember all the pieces of the context. You don't always remember what went down. And so after traveling and being born and lives and lives of being reptilian, the reptilians lost the original piece of why they hadn't come and instead were doing it because it was part of the nature of who they were. And they just kept going. And the trauma has been kept coming out for thousands and thousands of years since this original wound. But what also happened at that time was that there was a tribe of dragons who were, I consider my family and my friends and the people that I, I have m many, many, many of these deepest memories with, I know were dragons during that time. And they know themselves as dragons. They've known they were dragons since they were kids, but they never had a realistic a uh, logical understanding of how that could even be possible. Why is that not just a fantasy? Why is that not just something weird that's in my head? Why did I imagine myself as a dragon, as a small child? Why have I had so many dreams of dragons? It's unexplained. It was unexplained. And so this piece I offer to my dragon family out there and say there were some of us that knew we had to stop this trauma from being propagated. And so we also died and we also left our bodies. We traveled to the galaxy to be embodied as different species from different planetary systems around the circuit of stars around this area where the reptilians were coming across and assaulting. Some of us were even tried to be born as reptilians, but it didn't work out that well because there was such a militarized force. But many of us were born as Shihali and as Pleiadians and as Syrians and as uh, Laquinon and as Yahonians and many other galactic species that surrounded this reptilian force and became the first guardians that would fight back against our own people to try to stop the spread of this wound and this trauma and to somehow reconcile the healing and resolve the trauma ourselves without destroying another galaxy. So 
so that's that's the key to understanding what happened with the reptilians and the key there is so important to see and understand now we look at these other beings uh, controllers whether they're high masons or you know military industrial complex leaders or bankers or whoever and and many of them are some of them are reptilian souls reptilian dragon lords that still have that same trauma that have been born into earth and into humanity in order to continue playing out that drama because here's another planet they could take over right it's ripe it's wealthy it's amazing they could take this planet and they could make it theirs everybody wants to rule the world right and yet we're all here and the beauty of earth is that earth is this place where and the human species is a species that is so adaptable genetically that we can be many many other kinds of souls many other kinds of beings can be born into human form and feel right at home and if not right at home we figure it out <laughs> we work our way through it and and by being at home here, not interstellar, but all on one planet and all dealing with the issues of this planet's evolution, <clears throat> we have this amazing opportunity to create an entirely new level of peace and connection and consciousness around this world. And, and it's not just a connection of consciousness for Earth but it's a connection of consciousness of galactic soul streams going back <laughs> hundreds of thousands of years. It's to heal and to reconcile the path of this galaxy that is much, much longer than that which we conceive of as the history of humanity on this planet. Uh, <laughs> so <clears throat> here we are. And many of us as humans have these latent traumas from these galactic events. We fear these reptilians. We, um, we, we're afraid of getting chips implanted in us <laughs> because we don't want it to happen again. You know, we're afraid of the Star Wars programs because we've already experienced Star Wars. We're afraid of space-based weapons. We're afraid of all of these things. We're afraid of AI coming in and taking over because We've fought robot armies of AI. We've fought, you know, you know, programs and systems that take over consciousness. And so the first step is realizing that most of the worst part of all those fears and all those traumas has already happened. It already happened in the past. We already went through it. We have saw the worst of it. We lost entire worlds. We had entire, the entire galaxy was taken over by an empire. The beauty now is that we're on this planet and now we have the opportunity to do the greatest healing work anybody's ever imagined. We have the capacity to heal these wounds in all of humanity and by doing so, heal the wounds for all these different galactic species who are now all here together as humans at this time. And one of the first things that we need to do is we need to not look at a reptilian as an enemy. We need to see that they're just maybe traumatized. We also need to recognize that there are many, many reptilian beings that have already overcome this trauma and that are part of this galactic community and family. And there are many different channeled books uh, by different authors that verify that, that there's reptilians that are part of this galactic family of light. Um, that are part of this greater uh, force for good in the galaxy. And if we want to resolve the major problems, we want to really resolve the conflicts, we have to heal the dragon wound. We have to heal this wound by accepting that some part of that trauma is in all of us. All of us have some sense of what it would be like to have what the most precious thing is that we hold inside, ripped away and taken by somebody else. And when it's ripped away and taken by somebody else and treated as if they own it, what do we do to take it back? How do we reconcile that without revenge? How do we reconcile that without destroying someone else for hurting us so badly? 
And this is, this is the piece of the greatest healing that we're going through right now on earth. How do we stop the raid that's happening, the rape of the earth, the influx of military industrial control, of intelligence controls, of systems of government and systems of corporate uh, dominance that are trying to lock down our planet and control it and funnel the money to very specific individuals. How do we fight back from that without destroying our world? How do we fight back from that without creating even more trauma for ourselves and for others? And for myself and for many of my family, what we realized is that the greatest thing, the greatest gift that we can really, really give and honor is learning how to grieve the pain that we've felt. It's learning how to allow the fact that, yes, this has been painful, this has been hard, and what's happening on this planet is really upsetting. And if you haven't released the grief around that, then you're never going to be able to process that information in a good way and come to a resolution in a good way. You have to deal with the pain and the grief. The more you block it, the more you react from violence. The more you fight yourself and you fight others. But we can resolve this through feeling our grief. We can resolve this through going through deep healing experiences with each other. We can resolve this by forgiving, forgiving those that have led the process of destruction on this planet. And as we forgive them, and as we honor the mistake they've made, we also see them as unconscious. We see them as being traumatized. And we allow for that. And we realize, all right, we need to teach them something better. We need to show them a better way. They don't know any other way. They only know that one way through the keyhole that's going to put their family in a good position forever and make sure they're going to survive the apocalypse, make sure their kids go to heaven, you know, whatever it is that that's, they're, they're holding on to as the belief that the only way through that's perpetuating the cycles of action that they've been taking, now is time to show them another pathway, a pathway of healing and a pathway of reconciliation. Show them what it looks like to have worlds that are peaceful, abundant, in which everyone is powerful and everyone is rich and everyone has exactly what they need. I believe that it's really time for that now. And I, I firmly feel that the greatest way for us to really implement that on the planet is to start taking responsibility for guardianship on the earth to start really protecting and honoring our own planet. And there have been those of us who have been doing this for 13,000 years at least. Many of my soul tribe came uh, during the time of the last ice age. We've been here since Atlantis and the fall of Atlantis. We've been here since the flood and the spreading of human culture and language around the planet. And we've showed up at different very key critical moments in history to do our best to keep the flow of the divine principles and the architecture of sovereignty and truth and community as the fundamental pieces that are essential for life on earth and across the galaxy. We did this in Atlantis. We tried to do it in Egypt. We faced a lot of deep, intense trauma, uh, many of my tribe during the certain, certain periods in Egypt um, particularly during the rise of Akhenaten, when thousands of temples were burned and thousands of magi and priests and priestesses were killed because they, they were serving these other archetypes of our metaphysical rainbow of experience and um, the forces that were putting Akhenaten into power, led by General Horemheb, were wiping out all of the other uh, uh, forms of ceremony and temples and trying to just put the one God, the sun disc in place as the one commanding force. 
And so for some who are inside of that game of like, yeah, there's one true source. This is beautiful. That period of time was amazing because it was suddenly greatly abundant and like Akhenaten's temples were amazing, right? And it was so beautiful and light and he was such a beacon and a hero and amazing light being. But what you don't know and what you don't hear about so often were the thousands of other temples that were destroyed and histories wiped out and records trying to be erased during that time that Akhenaten didn't do, but some force in his military did. And then you also ask yourself the question, well, when Akhenaten died, why did a six-year-old get put in place and become the new battle leader, right? And this new six-year-old, Tutankhamun, he's the warrior king, you know, and he takes out all the Nubians. Do you think the six-year-old wanted to go attack anybody? No, probably not. The six-year-old was not a battle leader at all. It was all led by General Horemheb. And then the next thing you know, Tutankhamun gets knocked off the block. You have a very short shift of a couple power plays. And then the beginning of Egypt as a militarized government begins um, at the time of Horemheb. And this is the end of those dynasties. And this is the period of time that a lot of my soul family were there in Egypt during this time. And many of us had a lot of deep trauma and wounding from this because we feel like we failed to preserve that great magic and diversity in Egypt. But it has been preserved and it has been kept on because Egyptian magic is at the root of all the Freemasonry magic. It's at the root of Kabbalah. It's at the root of Druidry. It it's connects all the pieces together because it's really a galactic understanding of what it means to be and evolve as a species. And many of us were here at the time of Avalon and sat in, in circles and, and brought together the priests and priestesses honoring sword and chalice and blessing the land again and again and again and doing our best to bring peace to all of the land and bring all of the, the tribes that raided different villages into order by giving them abundance and giving them land and helping them see that they didn't have to take away from others to have enough for themselves. And this was another time of great work. And now we're here on earth and now we're here forging this guardian alliance. And I've created an academy to support the learning and the development of many of the people interested in embarking upon this journey of self-development to establish healing, peace, justice, environmental restoration, social ethics, political transparency, economic sovereignty for individuals and communities, and guardianship around the planet, built on very, very fundamental principles that fundamentally under, undermine conflict. They get conflict out of the way because it's a way of life in which you can live free from that conflict. And you can start to really address your own emotional traumas from a standpoint of compassion and love and support, both individually and on community levels. But I'm not alone. And there are people all over this world that already know this is the work to be done. And so I'm holding up a banner for these guardians to reconnect. But I also see all the guardians who are unrecognized. I see all those banners that are being raised all over the earth for those that are here to protect the planet and to steward it for our children for the next seven generations and beyond. And so as we close this cycle um, of my presentation, I just want to share with you some of these very, very critical principles um, and just leave, leave the community with the, the uh, experience of what these feel like inside your body. So I'll just say them out loud and you can just feel what they feel like inside of yourself. Sovereignty and freedom. Community and collaboration. Authenticity and integrity. Respect and truth. Honor and love, <sighs> courage, and accountability, purpose, and synchronicity, 
diversity, and openness. We stand by these fundamental principles as stewards and guardians of the earth and all life. We honor the truth of every individual and seek to bring greater understanding, acceptance, and unity through love. We trust in the goodness of all people and actively participate in the healing, transformation, and evolution of all beings. This is the work of the Guardian Alliance, and it's the reason why I'm here. It's the reason why I keep coming back. It's the reason why I came to this galaxy from Andromeda with so many of my star tribe and fleets. And it's the reason why I've kept this record and reassembled this record of what's happened in this galaxy to provide it to the people of Earth now. Because I believe that everyone has a right to know their history as souls and as beings and understand what's going on in their genetics? What is with all of these random emotions and feelings and memories that they have coming up and begin to really contextualize it and understand the bigger picture of who they are, why they're here and where we're going together now. Well, um, I, I, I certainly want to thank you for an extraordinary two to force and uh, for what I think is a very, um, it's, it's a very novel uh, uh, methodology of bringing together soul memories, soul memories of the historical record in the time space dimension of these events. And um, uh, it's very, I, I've, I've never seen anything like it before in, in exopolitics. Um, and, and so it's highly, highly unusual, extremely creative and extremely unique. And I want to congratulate you in that regard. Thank you. I appreciate that, Alfredo, very much. Yeah. Now, I, I just have a couple of methodological questions. Great. Um, that I'd like to ask you about. I mean, the, the first thing that that uh, comes to my mind, if you look at Dr. Michael Newton, uh, he uses soul memories to kind of explore the the interlife or the afterlife dimension. He uses it the other way in the sense that he uses a standard laboratory protocol and hypnotic regression, and then uh, has over 7,000 cases of soul memories of the interlife, mm -hmm. what happens mm -hmm. between lives. And Fantastic. yeah, and so you're, so you're taking, and this is, I mean, only you and Michael Newton have, have done this, and you're not inside the inside a laboratory context, but you're doing it more uh, outside the uh, lab, and that is spontaneous memories of groups that you have just come upon in a kind of a synchronistic search. I, I, I'm sort of yeah. trying to describe. Uh, yeah. Doing a fine job. Yeah, here, uh, what has 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 happened, and I realize that this is the first, the first, the first uh, kind of the first presentation at it, at least in this context, and that mm -hmm. you mentioned that you have all of your all of the other subjects, all of the other individuals that are participating in it besides yourself and that some of them have agreed to become to go public and some of them haven't so you've got different parts of your database i'm sort of trying to characterize it in exopolitical terms Just yeah exactly those members, those members of our audience who like that sort of ex, exopolitical characterization sure, um, thank you yeah, yeah, and 
And so, uh, and uh, aside from the, from the parallel memories that have come together exopolitically in assembling <clears throat> this, have you used any other independent database for verification? That is, you know, some other database, uh, whatever that, that, that might be, some version of <clears throat> the Lyra Wars or this, that, or the other thing uh, that uh, says, oh, we have this account here and that verifies with, with what our soul memories are. I, I, I'm just curious. Yeah, well, um, the few things that I've found that give uh, <clears throat> very, very, very clear confirmation for some of the events that, um, that I'm talking about here, uh, one of them is in a book by um, uh, Ken Carey, I believe it is. It's called Re Return, of, Return of the Bird Tribes. And there's also one that is called um, uh, uh, oh man, it's, it's slipping my head at the moment, but it's, um, it's the way of the serpent bearers or guardians of the serpent bearers. Um, I, I can't think of it, but you know what? I will definitely include it in the documentation that we'll provide with the articles. Okay. Um, and I'll also in, in that as well, make a list of many other, you know, resources that I've come across that, that validate bits of this. I have to say that <clears throat> for me, it's been a very, very challenging, uh, it's been very challenging to approach this from the scientific standpoint, um, as I've been always inclined to do for any metaphysical studies I've done since I was in high school, you know, I approach approach different fields of study <clears throat> with as much logic and science and verification capacity as I possibly can. And <clears throat> with this work in particular, it's been extremely difficult because I, so much of it is, um, is this spontaneous, like spontaneous memories that I've experienced with these individuals or that they've experienced with me or, you know, happened at the same time. And one of the things that you really want to be cautious of is somehow distorting or tainting the information that you get through those memories through the belief in some existing context, right? Some existing book that you've read or whatever, and you're just like, oh, yeah, that fits there, that fits there, that fits there. And so I, even though I was given books like uh, The Watchers and um, uh, Bringers of the Dawn and uh, more Kuan Yin's books and the Pleiadian agenda and all these things. I was given these books for years and years and years by people that I encountered as I would tell parts of this story. And they'd be like, you, you should read this. It's, it's exactly what you're talking about. It's amazing. She tapped into the same thing. You know, I would just take the confirmation <clears throat> and I'd say, great. And I'd put the book on my bookshelf and I wouldn't read it because I didn't want to have a preliminary, uh, uh, context already set up in my consciousness that I could instantly relate or try to fit the memories and the information that I was uh, uh, obtaining from myself and from these other individuals into someone else's framework. So I built it from scratch, you know, with, with just the pure memories and experiences and putting those pieces together. And then I was often surprised and happy. I mean, it's, it's always a very powerful confirmation experience just to meet somebody who remembers the same events as you or who tells you about some events that they remember and they happen to describe an overlap with things that you remember as well from another time. That in itself is great confirmation, but also getting the confirmation from friends of mine who have uh, read many of these different books and came at different points in time and say, you know, wow, that you covered exactly what um, they cover in the Pleiadian agenda about the Orion Wars, but you just went into a total different level of detail about it. I had no idea about. And, and so I would just take that as the confirmation um, and not rely on the books for my, my research and my confirmation. Um, at this point in time, 
I feel like it's an essential piece uh, as part of the assembly of my book and um, beginning to make this information public to go ahead and start recovering that material and finding references from all of these different individuals exopolitically as well as channels who have uh, experience or information that validates uh, different parts of this story uh, beyond the you know 50 or so individuals um, that or more than 50 but uh, of those that specifically have helped to put together this timeline from their own memories. Right, right. Now, um, I, I'd just like to ask you this question, and I, 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 I recognize that that you're the first in, in, in the panel that is coming forth now, and that, for example, what I wanted to bring up was a question around the role of artificial intelligence in this whole story, in this whole narrative, which you've brought up and uh, which Orion Bard, it looks, it sounds like from his self description, that's kind of his focus. So he's going to concentrate most deeply yeah. on that. Do you have any additional sure. words you'd like to say about AI or artificial intelligence at this point? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's definitely a, a topic of great interest for me, and it's it's another topic that I speak on. Um, I I've uh, discussed uh, AI and the future of humanity um, and our technology. Uh, I've spoken on that at the White House in um, leadership sessions with youth from around the world. I've also spoken on that at the United Nations in different panels and also subgroups talking about the future of humanity and our technological arc going into the future. Um, and so one of the things that I feel like is very relevant and essential to cover in this is that fundamentally, <clears throat> we don't yet as a human species, we don't fully understand the nature of intelligence and information in space-time. Um, from a galactic standpoint, and from the standpoint of a lot of the cultures uh, and the societies that we were participating in prior to coming to Earth, um, the, the universe itself and space-time itself is, by nature, has an innate state of intelligence to it. Now, that intelligence may or may not be externalized. In other words, it's conscious or there's consciousness, but it might be subconscious, routing existing information from one place to another or holding a certain uh, framework of existing information instead of creating new information and new ideas and sharing that outward. But one of the things that um, the Pleiadians in particular uh, shared a lot with us around the galaxy is that machines of any kind, ships, cars, <clears throat> uh, computers, radios, whatever, um, different kinds of machines have different faculties that allow those machines to express communication of the information in the fabric of space-time uh, more or less proficiently than others. Computers are highly proficient at this work um, to, to an extent because um, our computing systems uh, basically have uh, enough parts to them. They've got a screen, they've got data blogs, they can, they can host different levels of information, they process that information, they can make calculations, they can make decisions to an extent. And so computing machines are extremely sensitive to consciousness. And when I was an early teenager, I would go over to people's houses all the time and they'd have me fix their computers. It was like my first jobs, you know, when I was like 11 or 12, I was fixing people's computers. Well, no, I was probably 13, 14, something like that. Um, and what I would find is they would always be cussing at the computer and yelling at it. And they're like, this stupid thing, it's just a piece of, you know, whatever. And, and I'd sit down with it and I'd be like, okay, you know, cool. I got it, you know. And, but after I would reformat the hard drive, I'd clean the computer out, I'd get it working, and I'd, I'd do it a lot of times by being gentle and talking to the computer as I worked. 
And, uh, and what I would do is I'd tell them, I'd say, you know, if you don't want it to crash anymore, don't get mad at it. Like if you get mad, go in another room. And literally weeks later, I'd get calls from my dad's friends, my mom's friends. They'd be like, it's amazing. I don't know what you did, but my computer has been running amazingly ever since you did that. You know, it's no problem. And then occasionally some people, it would not work that way. You know, they'd use it for a while and they'd get mad at it. They'd call me up. They'd be like, this stupid computer does well, you know. And sure enough, their computer's crashing and, and all the time and it's breaking down. And there is, when we think about emotion, we're talking about energy in motion. We're talking about a resonance. And so when we start to talk about the real issues with AI, the issues with AI are not issues necessarily in intelligence. They're issues in morality. They're emotional issues. They're issues of trust, right? And and one of the things that, that's a major problem in our current world right now is we don't have good systems of trust. We don't know how to trust something that's going to think on its own. You know, when our kids are growing up, they start getting independent. They start doing things that we didn't tell them to do. And we freak out, right? We're like, oh, no, don't do that. You might hurt yourself or this could happen or this could happen. We project our own fears onto the intelligence of another being. And so as we're creating more and more intelligent structures of consciousness on the web and in the systems that we use, it's essential for us to come back and really look at where does our trust come from? Where does morality come from? Why do we make certain decisions um, that can help other beings or hurt other beings? And why do we do that? Because the more we understand those components, the more we inform technologies that exist with those components. And, and energetically, and I think Orion's going to touch on this a lot, a lot of what people fear as being the worst kind of AI, the kind of AI that's infiltrative, that could take over bodies, that, that's running wild and, and being destructive, one of the first steps we need to realize is that that's a consciousness. And that consciousness has a trauma. It doesn't matter if it's, if it's the trauma of the person who created it or the trauma is inherent in the AI from how the AI was treated. It's a computer that's been yelled at and screamed at and hurt so much that now it's taking back what it, uh, what it belongs. You know, it's, it's delivering karma. And so maybe it was in the creator of the computer. Maybe it was the creator of the AI that had great trauma. They created the AI and now the AI is playing it out. But the solution is the same either way. The solution is you have to deal with the root trauma. You have to release the emotional pain and the trauma in the root of what's causing that. And you can do that at many different levels. And that's much more of a spiritual discussion to talk about astral levels of consciousness, implementing etheric fields, changing the physiological structure of, of the, the space-time fabric and the vacuum structure around us itself. Um, so I think those are topics that probably are beyond uh, this conversation, but I imagine with Orion, you'll be exploring some of those a little bit further. Right. Very interesting. Now, kind of taking that and segueing into this area, mm -hmm. one of the data points that came up for, for me, especially listening to part one and part two, of the presentation today was reading uh, Mars Experiencer Michael Relf, uh, who, who uh, spent uh, 20 some odd years on, on Mars as a member of the security force of one of the Mars colonies there. And he's mm -hmm. written a two volume book, uh, uh, with the help of his wife, Stephanie Ralph, you can get it at marsrecords.com, download it for free. It's very instructive because part of the, <clears throat> part of the narrative in the book is a description of what I call hyperdimensional war. And that is actual armed conflict between the mm -hmm. 3D, i.e. time space, um, uh, 
colonies and armed forces that Michael Ralph, who's part of the U.S. Armed Force presence there, is having. Mm -hmm. And what looks to be like a hyperdimensional, in other words, a a uh, third, uh, a uh, a fourth density or so, uh, hyperdimensional. Let's just use the word uh, reptilian or Orion Gray. Uh, invasive enemy. The overall context being, and this is the meme that is out there that, that I think you've made reference to, that there's a quote, 1964 U.S. intelligence report that the Draco reptilians, who you've made reference to, uh, uh, had timelined Mars and Earth for occupation to make take them out of the human column and over to the reptilian column planets uh, by 2030 or 2050, and so uh, and so to take this uh, this solar system, including Mars and its moons and Earth and its moons, from being human celestial bodies over to reptilian. And so what, Mar, what Michael Ralph describes being on, uh, on Mars from, uh, I believe, uh, 1975 to 1995, uh, and describing there in detail these battles from the fourth dimensional ships, which are uh, being operated by either greys or reptilians coming in and it's like star wars i mean if you were there mm -hmm. you would see very little difference between the star wars and the it's called hyperdimensional war okay mm -hmm. so now could you reinterpret for me or reframe the standard exopolitical explanation is that these are the Dracos. They have timelined uh, the mm -hmm. occupation of Earth and Mars for somewhere between 2030 and 2050. And this is part of their rollout to flip over our solar system to be reptilian planets. So could you take mm -hmm. what you've just shared with us here and reframe Michael Ralph's Mars records. I mean, he was there for 20 years. He's a veteran of the wars. That's real stuff. And reframe it for us in light of your Star Wars memories and the reframing that you've set out in part four and five of your, your presentation. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I mean, obviously, any reframing I do uh, should not be considered uh, any validation of this individual or his work, but yeah. I will simply do my best to retranslate it um, based on based on what I know to be the the current situation in the galaxy and what's been going on. Um, you know, one of the first pieces, which is often a note of confusion that I want to speak on, um, is that. There's, there's often a lot of difficulty for people in understanding dimensionality um, in the universe. When we talk about fourth dimension and fifth dimensional beings and sixth and seventh and on and on and on. And <clears throat> I'll just say very, very clearly that the most simple way to, uh, to deal with those kinds of issues is to ask one question, is it physical or is it non-physical? Is, you know, are, are you dealing with something that's happening in the physical world? In other words, you're flesh and bone and body on a planet with a flesh and bone species, or are you dealing with something that's happening on the astral realm, which is influencing your mental consciousness, your emotional consciousness? Um, it's the realm where, you know, you see fairies in the woods because fairies live still in the woods, but most of them are astral. And some of them can dip their energy bodies into the physical and you see a light, you know, you see different things. Um, and also, it's important to understand that during star travel, when a ship is superluminal and it's traveling between different star systems, 
Um, what's, what goes on is very, very similar to thinking that the ship enters a different dimension or enters the astral, like it leaves the physical. But in fact, what's happening is it creates usually a boundary around the ship that separates the surrounding fabric of space-time from the space-time that's inside the ship. And this boundary allows the ship to basically travel through the fabric of space-time without ever warping any space-time. So instead of pushing its way through like a rocket does, which warps space-time, and because of relativistic effects, warps time. In that case, it takes a massive amount of energy. The more you bend space-time, the more energy it takes. You can never get to the speed of light. This is the big problem as far as scientists are concerned, why we will never be you know, faster than light ships. But it's a problem that's easily circumvented. You just surround a ship with a boundary condition that enables the inside space-time of that ship to be fundamentally separate from the outside. And now you've got a bubble that never accelerates. It can go this direction, this direction, this direction. No acceleration is happening at all. There is no gravitational warping that occurs, and it can go as fast as thought across the galaxy. So, you know, when I when I hear a story like that, um, <clears throat> it's it's a very uh, it's a very interesting one. I mean, there are certainly a lot of proofs for for people on Mars and secret bases on Mars. I've heard lots of great exopolitical testimony about that. Um, and my, my sense of the situation uh, is that, um, and I have to ask a, a question about it first, does he say that these assaults that are coming from reptilian ships are these physical ships that are attacking the bases there, or are they what he called, you know, non-physical, he's saying fourth dimensional or something? Yeah, I, uh, my interpretation is that this is hyperdimensional warfare, i.e., this is uh, non these are interdimensional. They're coming in from the lower fourth dimension, and they're mm -hmm. attempting to occupy Mars, from which is a in 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 three D time space from the okay. so that, fourth di dimension. Okay, so they're traveling. They're traveling in hyperspace, coming in, and then they're. They're leaving their hyperspace, coming into the third dimension, and attacking in the third dimension on Mars. So that's yeah, that's a absolutely. that's a pretty serious situation. And, yeah. And from the context that I'm aware of, um, th there has been uh, there have been different factions and levels of freedom that different groups have have had for interstellar travel and to go to different star systems for a very long time, but that Earth itself has been protected by this galactic guardianship force. Um, mm -hmm. That, however, does not mean that research vessels can't come here, like the Zetas. It does not mean that any galactic council vessel can come here. Um, and in fact, probably other vessels have come here that were just exploratory vessels with other kinds of beings um, and that we've seen, you know, in different points in history on Earth show up. Um, now, whether or not all of these beings are good and actually trying to help the Earth or humans, I mean, that's always an individual problem, isn't it? I mean, whether some one group in a species, you know, you can't say that reptilians are all evil because you don't know all reptilians, like there's some that are good, you know, and, and the same thing with you know, you can't say all Syrians are good because there could always be a, somebody who's really traumatized who starts a little band of, you know, Hellions and is coming in and causing problems on other planets. And that's why you have guardians. You know, we, we, we see it on Earth all the time. So the fact that there was ships coming in with uh, reptilians attacking Mars, um, my sense would be that they, they there probably was nothing put in place to stop that from happening because one, it, you know, Mars is, Mars is Mars. It's most of its life force is gone. You know, it's not got that much going on. You know, any species that's traveling around the galaxy should be able to visit Mars just fine as long as they stay outside of the, you know, the earth boundary or 
you know, they can go to the earth boundary if there's nothing that's a red flag on their, on their ship or their system. So my sense is that there's some reptilian forces that have been getting around and causing some problems like that, you know, um, raising some hell on Mars, you know, and, and, but would that same reptilian ship be able to come to earth and attack? Absolutely not. There are right. massive fleets in place around the earth um, and, and that can jump into earth space anytime they want uh, that would immediately stop any kind of craft like that. And I would be surprised if that kind of assault happened for very, very long of a period of time without some kind of intervention, unless there was some kind of contractual relationship going on for the souls that were there on Mars with these reptilians that were coming in, which sometimes soul contracts, you know, take precedence. And this is, this is what's happened a lot with um, uh, Stan, uh, Stan, uh, shoot, what's his, Romanek, who, uh, who does a lot of stories about his experience with the Greys and the Zetas and how he has, you know, hybrid kids and they've been visiting his house his whole life and others that he knows. And it's because he's got soul contracts. He is a Zeta. He is one of them. And he was born as a human to help build and develop this relationship between our two species um, as an earthling connecting back to his home species. And so his soul contracts take precedence. There's no, there's no galactic order that could stop him from connecting with his own species um, because they have this, this deeper level of relationship. The same thing is true of any reptilian souls on this planet. Nothing can take precedence of them connecting with the other reptilian species around the galaxy, getting information, using that information against us or whatever in any way they want to. But it, there is a line that's drawn when an extraterrestrial presence attempts to come to planet Earth or intervene in human affairs on Earth in a way that would stop us from our own journey of evolution and stop us from achieving our own sovereignty as, as a planetary species. That's what's being held. That's what's being protected no matter what. So uh, there's a lot of reasons why I could see that would go down on Mars. And, and if there's an agenda, you know, still existing in, in some faction of the reptilians, uh, to try to take Mars and try to take Earth and try to take, um, you know, take over our solar system, I'd say that's already pretty well established and proven just by those beings that we see that are reptilian souls that have been embodied on this Earth and have been trying to control this planet for a very long time already. Right. Um, so that's not a surprise to me that, you know, that, that doesn't come out of the blue. Um, right. Does that address your question yeah. from yeah, my yeah, standpoint? Sure. And, and, you know, there's a lot of congruence in what you say because Michael Ralph writes of the period 1975 to 1995, and mm -hmm. those, those actions were actually skirmishes. There were discrete battles during that mm -hmm. period. So it was, that was going on now. Let me jump over to Earth a second, because Great. if you study Earth, uh, and uh, this again, I'll go back to the 70s, uh, the, the scuttlebutt is that the, the Orion Greys fronting for the reptilians signed secret treaties with the Franklin Roosevelt administration in 1933, and with the and with the uh, with the Nazis in 1936, and that's when and and that gave them permission to abduct a certain number of people. But that those treaties were really Trojan horses for bringing in uh, subliminal uh, Draco and Gray mind control and that they infiltrated and mind controlled the governments of the Nazis and the governments of the West. And that world, you know, World War II became kind of part of this attempted Draco Gray takeover by mind controlling these governments. And that, that, yeah, that's, and that's why you, just to finish up the question, 
And that's yeah, go ahead. Why you, had, why you had Operation Paperclip and the Nazis coming back at the end. It was really the Dracos through the Nazis coming in to take over the U.S. after World War II. And that what was said was that if you went underneath Washington, D.C., there were Draco and Gray underground, deep underground bases under Washington and under various parts of the U.S., and that the U.S. government was basically under Draco and Gray mind control. And that's been the struggle between the white knights and mind control portion of the U.S. government and that there was an alliance between the Dracos and the AI. I'm just kind of painting out the exopolitical scenario. What are your yeah. comments on that as, as relates to the kind of the soul level that you have? I mean, it seems to me that you can have both, both what you paint and this going on at the same time. And I just would like to have your evaluation, your thoughts on on these various dynamics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would be happy to share. I mean, the first the first piece to um, to look at and cover is uh, is the congruency of the plan that you illustrated with with what would be the most effective way to infiltrate Earth now if you were going to do it or you know in the past hundred years which is to say um, while reptilian forces couldn't come to the earth the grays have been allowed to visit the earth and study humanity for a very very long time so there is a faction of the reptilians that still have their hive minded clone soldiers in other words they've still got gray stormtroopers ready to work for them doing whatever they want um, you know, programmed beings where their most of their individuality is programmed out. They're acting very much like an AI, as you as you uh, illustrate. Um, I don't necessarily agree with the context of the um, of using the term soulless, which I've I've heard used often when dealing with you know somebody that's uh, completely been taken over by another artificial intelligence. Um, because I would say that the soul of the individualized consciousness that has been co-opted or corrupted is actually the one thing that can actually defeat that corruption. It's the one, it's the one last kind of door that could be reopened to bring that being back. Um, and, I, and it's my firm belief that, that that still is always there. And so let's, let's talk about your scenario. You know, if you're if you're dealing with a, a reptilian faction throughout the galaxy that's still causing problems, still trying to do its best to raid world, that's somehow evading detection as it's sneaking around, and it's probably spending time mostly trying to go after worlds that are not part of the Galactic Federation because, or the Galactic Council, or the Alliance of Free Worlds, because those worlds are way too hard to go after now. You know. Um, because of the extremely high level of technology, detection, capacity, guardianship, etc. So you've got Earth, and it's like all alone and just chilling. And so you can't send reptilian ships. So what do you do? You send your own gray clone soldiers in to make some deals for you. And who are you going to make deals with? Well, you're going to make deals with whoever is the leadership of the planet. And probably you're going to make deals with whoever you've already got traced in your soul lines as being the ones who are carrying along the mission of the rept of the reptilian dragon lords from back in the day who have been carrying those family lines on earth i mean this is this is one of the reasons why the family lines are so important when we understand these um uh, socio-political contexts of of the the families that run you know the the greatest banking systems in the world uh, the people most responsible for the military industrial complex on this planet um, and, and many of these other issues and black ops groups and things like that. And they all orient around this idea that there's these family lines that have been keeping this going for a long time. And that's a very, very reptilian idea. And it's more older than that. It's a dragon idea. 
and it, and and it's the preserving of the dragon DNA and the preserving of these ley lines of force and power that's in these wounded dragon lords from you know Andromeda that are still here, still trying to take out revenge, and probably don't even remember that that's what they're doing. Um, most likely not, but they do know that they have an insatiable desire to somehow tame this chaotic humanoid species that seems stupid and you know weak to them and show them you know to put them in their place put them in their place underneath this hierarchy of uh, of uh, of power that they know is somehow their divine right and it's true their divine right is to be powerful but not necessarily to take power from others to have that power that, as we know, is force and not power, and it's actually false. And the problem with it is that it continually recreates the same cycle of karma. So they keep getting killed, and they keep getting born in, and they keep having to try to control everything again, and are unhappy the whole way because their life continually gives them back the reflection of the trauma that they're causing to others. And so they're extremely unhappy and extremely wounded. And, and we look in the roots of our government and the Nazi government, you can certainly see, you know, you can certainly see this like compulsive trauma that's going on. Um, you know, you look at the Nazis approach to things and it's, it's like a, it's just, it's a psychotic way of acting. And the psychosis is from some break in consciousness that doesn't actually have the whole picture. It doesn't actually see the whole picture of what it would be like to have a global, you know, community of people. Like, why do these certain bloodlines have to die for others to succeed? You know, why, why does certain levels of secrecy and control have to be implemented for somehow everybody to be safe? I mean, even a lot of the Homeland Security initiatives have been about keeping certain things secret in order to keep everyone safe and to keep everyone from going into chaos. And this hits to the heart of the exopolitical issue and the issue of disclosure. I mean, we are still dealing with, at the root, is basically a fear of war of the worlds that caused them to hide all the extraterrestrial information and technology in the first place. We hid the contact because if we just opened it up, people will go crazy. Oh my God, there's aliens and they're going to get us. And we're going to, you know, we didn't, there's, there's this lack of trust in the people. And because there's a lack of trust in the people, there's a lack of moral obligation and a lack of morality towards the public and towards the people of earth as a whole. And so this is what, this is what we're dealing with is this heart of this ancient wound. Now, are there bases underneath Washington, DC yeah, there's spaces underneath Washington, D.C. Are they full of actual physical reptilians and, and, uh, and Zeta aliens? Probably not. There's probably some Zetas down there, um, as well as in underground bases under Highway 40, you know, as I was able to verify with other black ops um, contacts of mine that have come out. And, you know, it's, it's really, really interesting, though. There's one last piece I want to share on the front of how does all this deal relate to the soul stuff, right? There's something that's really interesting that happens when, um, when an individual gains the ability to have telepathy, to remember their past lives, um, or remember ancient history inside themselves, uh, to be able to remote view or see through space time. Um, my my closest colleague who uh, was ex black ops, he was responsible for one of the biggest psychic warfare training programs in the government uh, with facilities in Illinois. And uh, he happened to meet me at a Psytrance party in uh, North Carolina at one point. He walks up to me and for about 20 minutes, he's talking to me and asking me questions and, and bringing up topics and testing my capacity to stay with him and my level of knowledge to whether or not he was going to reveal his background and who he was and where he had come from. And he had managed to actually get out of these black ops programs uh, by uh, maintaining a position on the Homeland Security Advisory Council. 
So because he got a position on the Homeland Security Advisory Council, which happens to meet, you know, 45 minutes from here um, in Cullowee, North Carolina, of all places, this tiny little town, um, because he managed to maintain a position on that, they weren't able to knock him off. But they tried. They tried a few times to kill this guy. Um, and uh, this gentleman's name, he's, he passed away uh, recently, a couple years ago from cancer that he'd been fighting off and on. And I have no question where the cancer came from and that it was probably a final result of the, a way they could kind of take him out. Uh, but his name was John Oriva. And, um, and John, you know, John shared with me some very, very key pieces of the underlying puzzle here. And what he shared was that a lot of these psychic warfare agents that have been inside the government, that worked with black ops, um, that have worked for Lockheed Martin and Boeing, particularly, you know, as they've battled each other for supremacy of the, you know, uh, the tools of the air and um, other secret projects. What happens is a lot of these psychic warfare agents suddenly start to wake up. And when I say wake up, it's that when you, when you have telepathy and you have remote viewing and you start to see the big picture, you also see how you're being controlled. You start to see how you get programmed. And all of a sudden, you're no longer able to be controlled anymore. Unless, unless the mind control system is really, really in-depth, in which case you're pretty much a potato anyway. But if you're, if you're not a potato, if you're a high-level agent, at some point you're going to see the puzzle and you're going to see how it's really corrupt. And at that point, you have a decision to make. One is do you continue serving the corruption to protect yourself and your family or whatever? Or two, do you start very carefully undermining the system that's in place and very carefully changing the structure from the inside? And what John shared with me was that countless of his colleagues had either managed to escape somehow, being killed, getting away, or they stayed inside to start really changing the, the structure of ideas on the inside of, of our government in particular um, and other world governments and, and do their best to be of service to a sovereign you know, collective of communities around the planet emerging um, and and uh, distributing the power that was believed to just be held by these, you know, these powerful forces behind these nation states and give that power back to the people. Um, and so I, I've seen that in action since that time. And I look at it like this, you know, it's it's like different souls that have participated in this great drama have been born into different places again in this time and we're playing out the drama from wherever we're at, but it's only a drama until you can really, really see the big picture. And then you can start to see how it's all this one really, really big transforming, healing, evolutionary process that when we eventually come out the other end of this wormhole, it's going to be so glorious and beautiful. It's the best story we could ever imagine. And, and the beauty of the, the universe is that you know, it's architected this story for us so that we can play this, this game out. Um, and I think that uh, it's really important for us right now to not look at, at other, you know, as being bad. Like they, them, those guys, the black, whoever, they're the evil ones. Forget them. Let's take them out. It's let's figure out how to heal the wounds so that we can all upgrade and we can get over this whole cycle of karma repeating and repeating itself over and over again um, and, uh, and start to really regain our freedom as a species and, and as, a, as a galactic galaxy of beings. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, on that note, we've come to the end of this segment, but I have one final question. On that note, would you think it worthwhile uh, after this uh, – next episode of star wars comes out the force awakens that we reconvene say early in 2016 and you share with us your perspective of the new episode of star wars and how this new episode shapes up in terms of the theme that 
you have been able to gather in parts four and five and what Disney has been, has, is now putting out. Yeah, that sounds great. I would be happy to join you again for All that, right. Alfred. And it'd be absolutely a pleasure and an honor. And, and I'm excited to see what comes out. I'm, I'm a little wary because okay. uh, it's, it's taken over by the Disney complex, but, but hopefully, hopefully the gems that, that have been laid into that story are there and unshakable. You know, there's, there's probably some underlying story that, that was part of the original writings that George put down that, that has really shaped the arc of the story that these new episodes are going to go through. Um, and so as much as flourish and fluff as they put on top of it, hopefully there's, there's a fundamental line of truth that we'll see shining through. Okay. Well, Adam Apollo, I want to thank you. Uh, Galactic history, the true story of Star Wars unveiled through interpersonal psychological research. This is uh, something unique. It's a breakthrough in exopolitical research and methodology. Thank you for all of the effort that you've put into us and thank you for taking time to be with us today. And we look forward to taking up this project on the other side 